Are your hormones at menopause causing a roller coaster? Is it your skinny genes or is it your genetic genes? What's missing when we're all trying to eat well and truly understand what that is and truly discovering what that is for you now in terms of exercise, but we're making only minor changes in our body? If it feels like you're in a marathon, you know, when innocent bystanders sitting comfortably on the curb tell you it's right around the corner and it never quite is, then this is for you. I've got an expert here to talk about more than hormones at menopause and why you may still be struggling though you're doing all the things and then some. As you know, if you've been here for a minute, we discuss the influence of hormones on exercise, exercise on hormones, and how to change what you're doing in midlife to cope with the changes and the challenges and age optimally. It's not always enough, though, alone. The exercise, I mean. The body functions thanks to integration of diet, exercise, lifestyle habits, environment, and genetics. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later today in a way that only she can. I'm Deborah Atkinson. You're listening to Flipping 50, where I address your top struggles and concerns, and I share what to eat, how to move, and how to change your mindset so you can have the energy, the vitality that you want, need, and deserve in this second and better half. My guest today is nutrition expert, certified functional medicine practitioner and speaker, Betty Murray. She's a PhD candidate and she helps women 40 and over harness their hormones to lose weight, optimize sleep, restore energy, and thrive in life. During her research for her PhD, Betty made four key discoveries that lead to hormone imbalances that plague women over 40 restoring balance to those key metabolic pathways are the basis of her hormone reset program that's helped her and her clients lose weight with ease, restore sleep, and turn up their energy. She's the host of this Functional Life podcast and the founder and CEO of Living Well Dallas Functional Medical Center. Betty is frequently featured nutrition expert on Fox News Broadcasting, CW33, NBC, and CBS. And I'm thrilled to bring her here to Flipping 50. Betty, thanks so much for being here. here. Thank you, Deborah. (laughs) Well, and I have to tell listeners, so we're laughing coming in because we're having so much fun in the green room. We almost didn't show up for the show. (laughs) All right. I can't wait to dive in because this topic is just so very geeky and interesting. I mean, we're we're hearing more and more about genetics and to kind of take genetics and then come back and talk about menopause. Um, I really want to unpack this. So weight loss advice. Let's start there because I know I've got my listeners' attention now, but weight loss advice is often simplified down to this idea that cutting carbs to control insulin will result in fat burning, or a slow thyroid must be the cause of your weight gain, or even stress causes weight gain, all of which are somewhat true, but you see that you say that this view is really short-sighted, misses other key hormones that may be causing yo-yo weight gain and weight loss resistance. So what is not getting so, talked about? You know, all, all of those statements to some degree are true, right? So I, I would say the world's littered, myself included, with women in this season of life where we've tried like a very low-carb diet you know, trying to cut my carbs so I could lower my glucose or my blood sugar so my insulin will work better. And so I'll therefore lose weight because if insulin goes down, I'll be able to burn more fat. Or if I'm under stress, I notice that my size of my butt gets larger and maybe my hair falls out and I can't sleep, you know, and I may be able to go in and get my thyroid tested or I've got all the symptoms like hair loss and loss of the outer eyebrow and all those things may be true. But especially for women, as we hit our late 40s and early 50s, even if one or more of those things are true, the changes in estrogen 
that happen during perimenopause and menopause are also underpinning a bunch of other metabolic processes inside the cell, it, hormonal messages in a lot of our large tissue groups like our muscles and our fat. And the problem is, is all of those take that one message and tell a woman, if you do it, this one thing, it'll work. And it works in some, but in a lot of women, it doesn't because overlooking the fact that the change in estrogen in women is a significant player in weight gain and yo-yo weight gain. Amen. So what do we do about it? Because every woman is hanging on the edge of her seat right now, waiting to cross the curb in her yeah, walk. Yeah, so here's the thing. So if we if we look at what's really going on here, so yes, the hormones matter. And actually, I, I we can't ignore them. So anytime I look at an assessment of a woman, I look at you know thyroid function, I look at adrenal function. So how do you handle stress? What are your hormones doing? We can automatically assume that pretty much everybody that is struggling with problem with insulin, but just reducing carbohydrates often won't do much for very long, if at all. So the, the other underlying situation that we really have to look at is we have to, where are you in your menopausal life? So are you in perimenopause where estrogen is fluctuating wildly and you might be in a situation where your estrogen is actually high compared to progesterone, which is your other major hormone that starts to decline in our 30s. And usually by the time you're 50, it is completely petered out. And, and we have to look at if you're menopausal, it's the loss of estrogen, estrogen. So it's really interesting. If you look in the research, a balanced hormonal picture with adequate estrogen and fluctuating progesterones, not high all the time, is part of what gives us our feminizing features and our fertility, but it is also what drives our body's ability to maintain lean muscle mass. So in women, balanced hormones result in a balanced body composition, especially for eating right and exercising and managing our stress. But in menopause, that significant loss of estrogen disrupts a bunch of metabolic activity in those cells. So then you say, okay, Betty, well, what do we do with that? Because I'm postmenopausal. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so here's the interesting thing. So I'll give a little bit of background of what's really happening so people understand the science behind that. So the hormones matter. So that's the that's requirement number one. We need to know all those hormones and how they're working. Number two, let me explain what's happening with estrogen. So the research shows that we ha when we have a loss of estrogen, that reduces our insulin sensitivity. So all of a sudden, too much estrogen is too much, and that can make us less insulin sensitive, more resistant. And then if I lose it completely, like menopause, it's going to also cause a problem. And it also reduces our body's ability to take blood sugar into the muscle cells, even while we're exercising, right? So during normal exercise in a body that's metabolically fit, exercise is going to increase the blood sugar uptake from the from the bloodstream as you mobilize it so progesterone if it's really high that other hormone actually reduces insulin sensitivity also so when it's fluctuating and doing things we can see changes and it also reduces our ability to burn fat and fat metabolism it changes a transport with a molecule called carnitine and then progesterone also reduces the uh, transporter called GLUT4, which is a protein that transports basically glucose into the cell in both fat and muscle cells. But what's interesting, so, okay, we go, okay, that sounds like if my estrogen is gone, I'm going to not be able to burn fat. But then if I have too much progesterone, I'm not going to be able to burn fat. So that brings me to the genetics. So some women have genetics. So we have different genes that affect our body's production of things like hormones. It affects how our body uses those hormones and then how the body takes them and sort of wraps them up and gets them ready for the trash to get rid of them. So when you look at some of the hormone um, genes that are affected, particularly with estrogen, certain mutation on those genes actually either help us get rid of estrogen after we use it or keep it circulating longer. So what the research also showed was that women that carried some of these genetic mutations, one of them is on a gene called co-methyltransferase or COMT, and about 55% of women can have some mutations on that gene. 
So when they are mutated and they are slow, that gene is running slow. So think of it's kind of running at half speed. They can't clear their estrogens very well. So they tend to keep them around longer. That gene's been associated with obesity, cancer risk, particularly things like breast cancer and ovarian cancer, diabetes risk, and just a myriad of other things, even cardiovascular disease. What's interesting in the research is the women that have that mutation that slows that gene down, they have a tendency to have excess estrogen, especially in perimenopause. So they've got, you know, kind of the wildly changing body composition. And then by the time the estrogen drops, that drop is so significant in their body, their weight gain is going to be even greater. So we're going to get greater like fat gain around the middle. We're going to probably have more hot flashes. We're going to have all those things. So here's where it gets interesting, because now I've painted this horrible picture and everybody's like, Betty, you're a buzzkill. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. That's what so, I was thinking. So here's the thing. So <laughs> we did the Human Genome Project. We mapped all of these out and we figured out that a lot of these genes are manipulatable by what we do and what we eat and what we take. So. So when we look at the co-methyltransferase gene, that one that probably many of us have, just because so many of us struggle with weight gain and all those other things, and if you hold your hand up on that one, and then you're also like, hey, I got hot flashes and all these other things, you probably have this gene. And if you don't, you can get it tested along with a bunch of other ones. So if you have excess estrogen, because you can't get rid of it, a lot of the nutrients that we eat on a regular basis and things that we can supplement actually improve that pathway, meaning it helps you kind of wrap your used up estrogen into wrappers and get it to the trash. So when you're in menopause and perimenopause and those things are fluctuating wildly, it can help you get rid of it. And when you're in postmenopause, you can make sure that the estrogen that you make from your fat cells, because our fat cells make estrogen, can get out of the body. So what are those things? Because I know everybody's got their pen ready to write down. <laughs> So everybody's, everybody's <laughs> right. heard that um, broccoli and broccoli sprouts are good for you, right? So they contain some ingredients, endol-3-carbonyl and another uh, derivative called DIM. Both of those products help our body kind of shift that excretion or that ability to get estrogen, estrogen out of the body into a more favorable pathway. So think of it's kind of like the three little bears. I have the perfect chair. You know, I've got one that sort of fits and the one that doesn't fit at all. The one that doesn't fit at all is the, the pathway I do not want to use. When I have broccoli and indole 3 carbonyl and those compounds that I can also supplement with, what it does is it helps the body sort of push everything over to the good chair. Also, things like berries, green tea extracts, bioflavonoids, which are found in your citrus, like grapefruit and lemon and lime, even at compounds found in hops actually helps your body excrete those down that more favorable pathway, lowering the load. When you look at the research and you look at the changes in insulin sensitivity, when you can improve that pathway, we see an improvement even in postmenopausal weight gain and reduces the risk of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. Um, not like 100%, not like that, but we see a at least a significant change in that risk profile because it actually helps the body move those estrogens out in the used up pieces and helps the body regulate that metabolic activity, right? right? So that gene is very important. There's a bunch of other genes that sort of hang out in that pathway um, that can affect that too, but that co-methyltransferase gene seems to play a pretty significant role. Which brings me then to the other side. So we say, okay, you're a woman, you've gone through menopause, and you're maybe not a candidate or don't want to do hormone replacement because you could definitely do bioidentical hormone replacement. And as a nutritionist, I don't do that. But as a clinic owner, I've worked with people for 17 years who, who have done that. And I have clients on both sides of that arena. But here's the thing. So the other thing that happens when we lose estrogen is when we have estrogen, we have calcium channels in our muscles that help us take up glucose, which is part of the reason why we, we can use glucose more efficiently when we're in perimenopause. So the other side of it is when we add appropriate exercise, 
to like muscle building exercises, things that turn on the adrenal receptors and the fat cells and the GLUT4 receptors, which are the glucose receptors that kind of help transport glucose into the muscle cell. When women do resistance exercise, that actually helps counterbalance the loss of estrogen and basically the fat gain aspects that happen to women because we no longer have that female hormone. So all the things, Deborah, that you talk about all the time about how important it is to do resistance training, those are things that not only are affecting your muscles that you can see, but they're changing your cellular metabolism at a very fundamental level. And, and they can help counterbalance all of these things that happen to women as we go through menopause, which not only makes us gain weight, but gives us a greater risk for diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. So, yes, there was a mic drop there, several of them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. No, and I, I really want to call everybody's attention to this, that this is one of those things where... All of the things that you've set up until this point feel like, oh my God, doom and gloom, doom and gloom, doom and gloom. <laughs> like there's things that may be stacked against us and that here's why and here's why and here's why. But you've also pointed out so very clearly that there are things that we can do, namely, you know, some supplements, some ways that we're eating and the exercise that we're doing. So believe me, my antenna went up when you said, appropriate exercise. So I'm calling you on that again. And I just want you to say a little bit more about that. Is that according to your research, is it specifically an only resistance exercise? Are there other things that also Definitely support it? Or high intensity intervals, you know, they're intervaling back and forth between high intensity, low intensity. So circuits, those kind of things help too. When we see like the women lose most women, I would say the general gist of doing like long-term cardio, the distance runner, the distance cyclist, this, you know, that is not a generally a good, you know, weight management program for a woman, particularly when we get over 40. And it, it, we don't see the same sensitivity response in the muscle cells to those kind of activities where we do long duration endurance work. The other thing is the fat cells, the fat cells have flux with that receptor that I talked about, the GLUT4 receptor, and it basically goes to sleep mm -hmm. in women that are not exercising and are in menopause, right? And so when we do exercise, that's, that's your endurance sort of training, it, we don't get stimulus to that. And there's also an adrenal receptor on the fat cells that, is responsible for kind of basically uh, taking the fat out of the fat cell and nervating that fat and saying, go throw this fat out and get it into the bloodstream so you can burn it. And that receptor goes pretty much dormant on our fat cells, particularly on our hips and thighs and buttocks as we go through menopause. And so you have to do things to stimulate it and, and weight training and intensity and intervals are a better stimulus to it. So so good. All right. Definitely mic drops in. They're coming very hot and very heavy. So I love it. Are there things, so you've kind of alluded that endurance training, not best. Um, does it go the opposite way? I mean, can you go so far as to say, because I think we've hinted at this before that definitely I see adrenal fatigue. I see the effects of higher cortisol levels. I saw it personally myself. I witnessed it, took one for the team in terms of research of one. But would you go so far as to say, you know, endurance doesn't help support it and it actually I would say the majority it. of the time, yes, because most people are training at a level that's beyond that fat burning zone, number one, you know, if somebody could keep the, the relative, you know, uh, activity out of it lower and lower their stress and be doing everything else perfectly, maybe it wouldn't do as much. Right. But let's face it. That's not a reality. I, uh, yes, exercise, because mm -hmm. we can't forget those other hormones that we talked about. So endurance exercise, especially for long periods of time are catabolic. They just raise cortisol. And when I raise cortisol, I'm going to raise insulin. I'm going to raise the requirement for glucose to be utilized. Well, remember, you're a menopausal woman and your capacity to use glucose that has been mobilized into the bloodstream is diminished. So your body will preferentially use your glycogen storage in your muscle and glycogen from the liver. 
And then what it does is instead of going into your fat cells, and I don't care if you're in the fat burning zone or not, it's going to go back and make glycogen and glucose at the liver. And so what we do is we tear down muscle. So we lose more muscle. We get, we get no real muscle gaining effect. We're catabolic and all we're doing is perpetuating the problem. And I'm somebody, I love cycling. I love cycling, but I do, I cycle like one day a week. And then I do other exercise that's targeted, weight bearing, short in duration with a level of intensity. And I have a much better body composition, but mm -hmm. I, I do still do some endurance, but I don't consider that fitness for fitness sake. That's for my mental and emotional. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like so for for a listener, it's kind of like the 80/20 rule, right? I mean, you you most of the time do all the things that are right in in terms of your hormones and supporting yourself and then 20% of the time it's okay, you can kind of go off the rails and it, as long as you get back on track, yes, you're good. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Sweet. So, so there's lots of people out there who, who like you, like, I love that endurance exercise. It's, I have to hold myself back, even though I've had every evidence for years now that my body right now doesn't love that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember I yeah. was doing triathlons, you know, and I was training for them, doing an Olympic mm -hmm. distance. And I remember I, I had, you know, my my watch that kept track of things. I'm tracking everything. I'm working out twice a day. So I'd ride in the morning or run in the morning and then swim in the evening. And, and I remember I'm like, how is it I'm gaining weight? Cause I, I was burning almost more than what I was taking in, you know, based on what my caloric expenditure was. And it's like hormones rule the roost yeah. and your body will do whatever it takes to hold on to that extra mm -hmm. nourishment when your body's catabolic. And it's just the truth. That is such a great example. And it comes back to something I've said many times, but I want you to let this sink in, listener. Based on what Betty just said, it's you're not a calories in, calories out equation. Calories don't control what happens to your weight. Hormones control what you do with those calories and whether you're able to burn fat or store fat. Letting that sink in. That was a pregnant pause. That was not an air. Okay. All right. Talk about genetics. Is it my mom's fault? So I, I love genetics. I've been working in genetics for, gosh, about seven, eight years. Um, and so, so genetics. So we get one from mom, one from dad. So we get one copy of each. 95% of our genetics are identical between people. But that 5% that is different between us and it's different between us because our ancestors had different environmental pressures. So somebody whose ancestors hail from, let's say, Northern Europe had different environmental pressures than somebody that came from the Philippines, let's say. The weather is different. The food is different. The requirements are different. So those genetic mutations probably came about just to help us survive. So the interesting thing is that as many of those genes encode for making a protein, making an enzyme, utilizing different hormones. And when we did the Human Genome Project, we mapped them out. We were hoping to get like one light switch for every single change we wanted to make. And we have a little over 22,000 of them. And it's this combination of genes that turns us on and turns on different aspects. So the first thing you need to know, if you look into genetic testing, is it's never about one gene. It's the genes that work together in a constellation that make up who you are. So the idea that a single gene, the Alzheimer's gene or whatever, is your destiny is completely inaccurate. Now, some of those genes, because of their mutations, may confer improvement. So in some cases, they can actually improve things. But in a lot of cases, they may confer a little bit of risk. Now, what makes it risky? Most of the genetic mutations that show up as risky today, so some of them might be the APOE gene, which is called the Alzheimer's gene, or the MTHFR gene, those were probably not a problem a million years ago. Because if they had been, we would have actually bred them out of the gene pool, right? Because we wouldn't have survived. What has really happened is our environment, what we eat, what we think, what we come in contact with, what's on the planet, all of that 
has radically changed since the Industrial Revolution. And really, honestly, minor changes even during the Bronze Age. So we're talking about less than 250 years. And we've had a radical change. We have over 90,000 chemicals we add to our food and our environment. Most of those have to go through our body and move through these genetic pathways to get out. And that's really the problem. So yes, your mom may have given you some crappy genes. I've had my entire genome sequenced. I've done every gene test that's available out there. Not that I'm a glut because they don't change, but I'm always comparing what different results come back. And I don't have the greatest genes. Like I don't, I don't detoxify estrogen well at all, right? So I may have a little bit of a risk that I got genetically, but what I do, what I think, what I eat, what I come in contact with, all of that stuff is what sets it up. So your genes load the gun, your lifestyle pulls the trigger. So if you know your genes, like I do genetic testing on my clients because I want to know it because that helps me figure out the right direction somebody needs to go. But they don't necessarily load the gun and just pull the trigger for you. So you have incredible capacity once you know how you're wired to determine what you need to do to optimize that wiring. Love it. Love it. Okay. So genetic analysis is becoming more and more popular. I mean, do you think that, I mean, if any of us are struggling right now in menopause, there are a lot of women who, you know, are either in perimenopause or in postmenopause here who still, you know, haven't quite found the answers and really are not comfortable where they're at. It's just feeling like maybe they're settling or needing to. Is Are the genes a big part of how to pull that together and figure out how do we reach the right set of these are the actions and or inactions that you know, I should be doing. I, I love having the genes because it helps give, like I said, it, it's, a, it's a metabolic blueprint. So like the genetic test I do that I work with, the company is called Metabolic Blueprint. And that, and that gives you the blueprint of your house. So if you were to stand and look at a house being built, you could see the foundation. So if I'm standing on, in Texas, we make them out of concrete. So I can stand on that foundation. I can see where the plumbing's coming up. I can see how, how wide the house is, how deep, how long in the front. And I can see kind of distinguishing this is a garage, this is a general house. So it gives you your foundation. What you do on top of it, what kind of you know style you make the house, whether it's a shaker or colonial or modern, all of those things are what you add on top. So I think the genetics help you understand that maybe your house is built to be a ranch style home and you can't build a three story condo complex with a pool on top. So I think that's valuable. There's other things like I like looking at the genetics to understand it to know, hey, maybe you don't detox your estrogen well, and maybe you don't metabolize fats well in a high fats, high saturated fat diet is going to backfire for you. I happen to carry that gene. I, I, I would love to have the bacon and avocado keto diet, but I actually gained weight because I am a hyper absorber of saturated fat. I will absorb fat 30% faster than somebody else. Yay. <laughs> but I but I know that from my <laughs> genes. So I can go, oh gosh, that's why the keto diet doesn't work. So I can figure out what what is the mm-hmm. right way for me to eat, right? And then there's other things like looking at what your hormones are really doing and looking at is it an adrenal problem or a thyroid problem or is it your estrogen metabolism? That starts to tell you the, the structure on top of the house, the fun stuff that you get to design and decorate, right? Because if, mm-hmm. I, can, yeah, oh, so if I can design and decorate my house, <laughs> now that I know my foundation, I can really make a really solid home. And I think that's the beauty of knowing the genetics. And we're just now scratching the surface. I mean, it's come a long way since the very beginning. And now that artificial intelligence is getting involved, where they're able to take large amounts of data and sort of coalesce that, it's getting better and better. I love it. Oh, and I think that for every listener here, there was suddenly just a like, oh, what a relief, right? I mean, so everybody listening is picking up clues, whether you know or not what to do yet with those clues. But I think some of the things that you just said about it, why the keto didn't work for you, and yet, you know, lots of listeners potentially thinking, but it worked for, you know, my friend or it worked for, you know, my partner. Why not for me? And there you go. So it, you weren't designed for that to work for you and or it not designed for you. 
I love the the piece of hope that it's you've given and inspired. You've got just a, a wealth of knowledge, but also you have a gift for giving an analogy that makes it very understandable. So thank you for that. So I'm going to ask you to turn your gift on for me. So while we've got you here, is there a question that I should have asked you that I Mm, haven't yet? Let me think about that. So, you know, I I guess the other, the other area that I would probably want to talk about, because it's going to get a lot of, a lot of play this year, because there's some books coming on about, about uric acid and, and how our cells work. So uric acid is something that's made inside the cell when there's damage happening to the cell. And we often see it in the bloodstream and uric acid being elevated is associated with gout. So if anybody's ever heard it, they're thinking gout, which is a painful joint condition. So what's interesting is I was looking into this research. I read some of the early, um, the early studies that came out from Dr. Rick Johnson from, I think, University of Colorado looking at it. And I was like, hmm, I wonder if that happens with women. Right. Because I'm always like, why do we get the short end of the stick? <laughs> and, and what I found was that women are more likely to be um, making excess uric acid just by going through menopause. So uric acid is what the cell makes when it thinks there's damage happening. And it's the mechanism in which all animals, including uh, one cell organisms, control fat gain. So animals that hibernate, their uric acid climbs during the summertime, like bears, because they're eating foods that drive uric acid up. And it's an instinctual thing. All animals that do that, do that. And so, so part of what we want to do is control uric acid as women, right? So, and ours naturally goes up. So what's really interesting is there are things that we talk about all the time to not eat high fructose corn syrup in any way, shape or form. Lots of fructose, lots of beer, because all of those things raise fructose in the blood, which raises uric acid. And things like um, charcuterie, aged foods, other things. So the other piece of that genetic pie is what's being turned on or turned off in your cell. So if that's the case, the other thing we want to look at is what's happening inside the cell. And and the truth is, is if I reduce high fructose corn syrup, the sodas and other stuff, which I'm sure, Deborah, nobody that listens to your show ever does those. Well, <laughs> ever is a long time. <laughs> well, you know, the thing is, is, no, is, is that's, that's an area that you can really gain control also. So it's making sure that you're not getting fructose, high fructose corn syrup, all of those things in your diet, because that is also affecting the interior of your cell, its ability to kind of do its job. It, show, it's, it basically slows down your engine inside the cell. So instead of having a Tesla, you have a 1984 Yugo. So, so the other thing, because I want people to feel empowered because sometimes it it feels like you're just on this uphill battle of trying to kind of win over your body. And so I want you to think about if I go through my pantry and I go through the stuff in my refrigerator, including all my sauces and all that stuff, my breads, my crackers and cookies, get anything out that has that stuff in it because that'll counterbalance what you're trying to do. Because your body is wired to make more uric acid anyway, which is basically telling your their cells to slow down, right? Absolutely, yeah. You're so very empowered to do that. That is awesome. Great tips. Love, love, love. Yeah, you know, and we've all got those things that we, you know, still are doing. And yet I think the mentality we grew up with is, you know, if I exercise, then I can do this. Or, you know, it's kind of this, I can earn my way to do this, but it's just not the way that it works, really. So shifting the whole mentality about the reason you're exercising in the first place is the first place to start there. But none of us really earns the right to, I like to think of it like um, arsenic, like a little bit of arsenic wouldn't be okay, would it? Right. right so let's right. just not do and that. And I'm not saying don't ever have a piece of cake or a glass of wine or those kind of things. Yeah. But it's the insidious way these things have snuck into our diet and we don't recognize it's probably the second yep. ingredient in every bread you can buy. You know, so it's yeah. little things like that. But once you know, then you're completely empowered. 
So love it. All right. You have a free quiz and I want to talk a little bit about that because quizzes are hard to resist. So what are they going to find out if so they take that, that quiz? quiz is designed to help you figure out what your dominant hormonal problem is. Like I alluded to in the very beginning, often we have maybe the underpinning of estrogen changes, right? Either it's too high, too low, mm -hmm. all over the place or completely gone. Then we may very well have a thyroid or a cortisol problem or even a insulin sensitivity and kind of liver processing problem. So what this quiz is designed to do is to help you figure out what your dominant hormonal problem is. And so when you take the quiz, it'll tell you that. Then you get this great personalized report. This is sort of walk you through what's going on and some of the things that you can do to fix that. Beautiful. Love it. Okay. So listeners, we're going to, that quiz is going to be at quiz.metabolicblueprint.com followed by some alphabet soup. And I'm going to put that in the show notes. Your show notes for today, by the way, will be at flipping50.com forward slash hormones at menopause. Betty, thank you so thank much. Thank you for so being much for here. having me, Deborah. It was fun. This was so awesome. So listeners, if you didn't get this. <laughs> the one or the two takeaways are really that you do have hope, you do have power, and resistance training is a girl's best friend. <laughs> so there you have it. You got a little deeper insight into your hormones at menopause, the impact of your cellular metabolism based on genetics, and hope. So I'd love to hear from you. Leave a comment in the show notes or join us in the Facebook group. If you've got a question you'd like me to answer in an upcoming episode, that's the facebook.com forward slash groups flipping five zero insiders. And what are you waiting for? Let's start flipping 50 today.